Kia ora koutou. Um, there are a few rules for doing a TED talk. Uh, one of them is that you're not allowed to speak more than 18 minutes, and the other is uh, you're not allowed to talk about pseudoscience. I'm going to start by talking about pseudoscience. <laughs> uh, so what is it? Uh, apparently a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on scientific method. So it's like something that's not science pretending to be science, like an apple pretending to be a pear. <laughs> or like that guy who, who claimed that the earthquakes in Christchurch, Ken Ring, was, was uh, caused by the moon. Or the famous self-help guru who was, who, was friends with, who was friends with Michael Jackson and went on Oprah to talk about quantum healing. He believes that quantum physics shows that everything in the universe is connected. Well, to be honest, when I first heard about Deepak Chopra, I was fascinated, uh, because at the time I was doing a de degree in, in physics and studying quantum physics at university, and this connected with another part of my life. So I had an unusual childhood. This is me at four years old at my first class at the School of Philosophy. <laughs> so. We sat around Uncle Norman, who is a lovely old carpenter, and he read us mystical texts from around the world, from the East and the West. And then when I was 10 years old, I learned to meditate, and I was very strict with my whole family that we meditated in the morning and the night. <laughs> when I was 15, I fell in love with physics. And it seemed to be magic the way that one law like gravity could connect so many things, like why I was sticking to the roof of the house at night while gazing up at the stars, <laughs> and why the leaves were falling from the trees, and the moon in the sky, and the arc of the power lines. This seemed to be magic to me. It seemed to take me deeper into this mystery, and I wanted to learn more about that. I also had this dream of starting a renaissance that began right here in Wellington, New Zealand, and spread across the world reconciling conflicts. It would bring together art, science, and spirituality. So when I went to uh, study physics at university, I got a bit of a shock. And I, this is me running out of a lab in frustration. There, there just wasn't much of a sense of adventure. The, the answer was in the textbook, and it was like a race through all these cords and buttons to get there. And I always had a male lab partner who knew what to do with them all, and they, all, these, all these boys seemed to know the answers, and I felt like a silly girl. I went home and had to stuff my face up against the speakers while I played Mozart's Requiem on full volume just to feel some... some um, uh, sort of spirit fill me up again. <laughs> so I was rescued by the, from this situation by the great New Zealand scientist, Sir Paul Callaghan. I met him in the corridor. I didn't know who he was, but he gave me this job traveling around New Zealand interviewing scientists and writing stories about them. And for the first time since I'd started science, I found the magic again, and I found it by connecting with their passion and their personal stories. So Paul became my mentor, and he helped me to go to Imperial College in London to do a Master's in Science Communication. And something I'd learned from studying physics was that physicists really don't like pseudoscientists. And for me, this was really interesting because it was like two parts of myself playing out against each other in my mind. And I really wanted to get to the bottom of this conflict. So I had the opportunity in my dissertation to um, study this clash. And I interviewed quantum physicists and pseudoscientists and people in between. And they're all interested in quantum physics. And I called the dis dissertation, Does Quantum Physics Show That We're All Connected? So what I found out is that the crux of the argument that Deepak Chopra and others have is this thing called quantum entanglement, which is where these two tiny particles that are smaller than atoms, they get entangled with each other. And when you pull them apart, it can be for miles and miles, and you flip one of them, the other flips instantaneously. It's like they're the same particle. 
And this is true, like you can do that experiment again and again and it comes up true. Uh, it's one of those funny things about quantum physics. Um, but it's, <laughs> um, it's also the, the, the reason that uh, pseudoscientists think that everything in the universe is connected. But the thing is, they've made a massive leap from two particles to the whole universe. And that's what, that's what makes physicists really angry. <laughs> when, when, you, when you talk to the, um, to the pseudoscientists, they haven't thought about that. They're just excited about having a paradigm shift whereby people can connect more and not be so individualistic. Anyway... So that's science. It makes sense that you can't talk about it in a TED talk because it's one thing to pretending to be another and that's not very honest. But <laughs> so what is real science then? And it's interesting, there's not really an agreed scientific method. There are lots of ways you can do it. But what is generally agreed is that it follows these principles. And one is skepticism, that you question everything. Another is consistency that uh, every theory that you come up with has to be consistent with every single observation made by every single person in science in, in known history. And this is a massive requirement. <laughs> it's like if you had a theory that all sheep were white and it had been true for a thousand years and then a black one came along, well, you have to throw the theory out. <laughs> And another thing is it has to be new. So scientists are always looking for new knowledge about the universe. So to put it simply, they're rebel explorers. They, uh, they question everything, and if it's not consistent, they throw it out. And also, if you think about it like that, we can all be rebel explorers. So back to pseudoscience. Now, um, it seems... Yeah, my question is... Why would, some, would someone who's not a scientist pretend to be a science, scientist? Why do people feel they need to validate their theories using science? And my take on this is that we believe in science. Deepak Chopra defended himself by saying that um, he was defending the wisdom traditions of the world by referring to quantum physics. Well, physicists don't say that they meditate to make people believe in their theories. It goes, the, it goes one way. Science is the authority in our society. And uh, it didn't used to be. Uh, when science first em emerged, the church was the authority. And that's when Galileo got put under house arrest for suggesting that the sun was at the centre of the solar system and not the earth. So in those days, scientists were the little guys challenging the system. And now they've become the big guys, like holy priests able to bestow the blessing of scientifically proven onto <laughs> shampoos and diets and <laughs> self-help regimes and even government policies. So Freeman Dyson, a, the uh, English-born American physicist, said this, Scientific experts are paid and encouraged to provide answers. The public does not have much use for a scientist who says, oh, sorry, but we don't know. <laughs> but isn't science, um, isn't science all about asking questions? I showed this picture to people, to uh, scientists, when I'm taking communication workshops, and just to see what they think. And I'm surprised how much they agree with this. They feel trapped by this pressure to produce results and by the environment where it's not okay to not know. And I, I show them this picture as well, and they like this one. <laughs> because, um, they, because scientists are explorers. The thing that they want more than anything else is to discover something that no one's ever seen before. So the question is, is science losing its way by becoming the big authority? And if we're not allowed to talk about pseudoscience, maybe we should also be careful about science and apply the same critical judgment to science as we do to pseudoscience. I think an example to, to um, explain this is, is the Fukushima disaster. 
the Professor Yuko Hama is, the, is one of the executives on the Council of Science in Japan, and she spoke about the climate before the Fukushima disaster, that there actually were scientists who were fearful and, and concerned about the safety of the nuclear power plant, but their voices weren't being heard because there was such an alliance between the government, the nuclear industry, and the scientists that they'd convinced the public that nuclear energy was 100% safe. So Freeman Dyson goes on to say what's happening here is the public is looking for scientists who can be confident about their predictions, and therefore scientists tend to talk with more certainty than they think, and then the public begins to believe their predictions, and then they begin to believe their, their theories, and then their theories become dogmas, and then sometimes those dogmas are not right, and that's why we need heretics who question the dogmas. So bring back the rebel explorers. <laughs> Science is an incredible feat of subjecting your own beliefs to, to skepticism and consistency. And if you can play this game, you can call it science. But if you can't play this game, if you're not prepared to give up your beliefs, if science um, shows them, doesn't support them, then don't subject them to science. And don't call them science. I'm not sure that Deepak Chopra would give up his ideas about consciousness and meditation if the science pointed the other way. But you know, like, it doesn't have to be science. I meditate. I love it. It makes me feel really good. It's not science. I don't care how many, uh, how many studies come out that, that prove it or that say it doesn't work. It, I love it. And there are so many things that, that uh, are, are beyond science. And there are things that we shouldn't apply skepticism to. You can imagine a mum on the sideline of her little kid. Come on, you have a 19.5% chance of getting a goal. <laughs> Thanks, mum. <laughs> or um, Martin Luther King in front of a crowd of thousands. I am sceptical about the potential of overcoming the forces of evil. I can't imagine a crowd of hundreds of people following, after, following behind him into an armed police force with that battle cry. <laughs> so, many, so many of the things we've heard about today, love, compassion, courage, they're not science, but they're important, and we know they are. Scientists know they are. We all know they are. Um, after I studied science communication, I... I uh, went through a period of about eight years where I decided I'd make myself a guinea pig and, and subject all my beliefs to the scientific method, scepticism and consistency. And during that time, I threw out a whole lot of unnecessary and damaging beliefs. For example, the one that homosexuality was not natural. Well, I turned out to be <laughs> homosexual. <laughs> And, <laughs> and and that work and that work <laughs> and that work defines me. I don't need to do a nine to five job. At the end of that, I felt very free, but also I came to the point where I I, I didn't feel I could move, and because I, I was so doubtful about everything I was doing that I couldn't even decide what to have for breakfast. <laughs> And at, at that point, my mentor, Paul Callahan died. I broke up with my partner, and I went to, for a trip to the Australian desert. And it was in that, that vast landscape of warm, um, warm red. I was by Uluru, Ayers Rock. And the rock shouted to me, <laughs> to my intuition. It said, you can come out now. You've been in hiding for long enough. And oh my God, the relief. <laughs> I, I, I let myself be irrational just, for the, just to play because I'd, I'd, I'd developed my rational thinking. I could trust that now. 
And since then, my career has taken off, my relationships have taken off, and I've just been a lot happier. <laughs> so my, my message is, if you're a scientist, be a scientist, and we need to free the rebel explorers. And then I'd also like to say that uh, we need to value those things that are beyond science, and there are some things that we, we don't need to apply scepticism and doubt to, because it might crush them. And um, perhaps if um, mystics and scientists stick to their own business, they could be fellow explorers sailing into the unknown. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to finish with Einstein's quote here. The most beautiful we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science.